Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I thought it was just me on camera for a second there. And so I was just presenting your show for a little bit, like, hey, welcome to Stuart's show. It's oh, awesome. mate, you need to just take the introduction away. You could almost introduce me at this rate. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. Well, anyway, it's great to be here. Great to be on your show, Stuart. And yeah, thanks for having me along for the ride. Yeah, man. What's, um, how old were you when you made your first like video? How old was I when I made my first video? Well, when I first, made videos probably like 14 i would say roughly 14 from memory and it was my sister that got into it so she had a camera and she started making videos and i jumped in and made a few videos with her that you know those funny like skit things that you do when you're a kid yeah it's so cool man like i think especially how you know like when you're young and your creative instincts are not like um limited by like what other people think or what you know sort of time restrictions and that sort of stuff like you're more prone to i guess giving things a go than you would if you know you're sort of under those types of pressures aren't you because you'd obviously know that quite well work having worked in tv and and that sort of thing hey eh? yeah that's a really good point absolutely like when you're just making a video for the fun of it it just to literally just be a piece of art you know there's no money involved in it or anything like that when you're a kid uh it's it's typically just for entertainment purposes when you make a video as a kid then when you get into business you know a client is wanting a video uh, to stimulate their business they want people to see the business and then attract them to to their business which is awesome and to make the video effective it is important that it holds people's attention so making it entertaining can be a big part of that or just having a message that really speaks to whoever it is that you're trying to attract because then they'll see the video and resonate with it. Yeah, because that's yeah. obviously something that you're doing day in, day out is trying to hold people's attention because I think with the work that you're doing, it's like it's that teaching people how to present with confidence and also just creating those videos as well. Like, And <clears throat> having a look at like your one for one of your former clients, the roofing client that we know quite well because we were going to, I was teaching you how to run Facebook ads on that one, remember? But then it was it's obviously right. just a bit much, so you stuck to the YouTube ads. But that seemed to have a really good market for it because you you caught people's attention, you told them what they were about, um, how they can transform you know, their roof in less than 15 seconds, which obviously seems to be the big thing these days, especially with a lot of videos that go viral. If yeah. you can't get their, keep their attention for 15 seconds, they'll move on. <laughs> totally people got to see that it speaks to them and not everyone's going to watch want to watch a roofing video that's going to apply to people that um have a roof <laughs> that they want to get fixed um but you try and make it appeal to other other people might see it and go wow well, i like watching this they'll keep keep watching it but you are trying to target people that have a roof or might need roof work yeah mm. absolutely Thanks for your compliment, by the way. No worries, man. And, when... and so I know we've started, so uh, I thought, hey, it would be good to do a little, little intro. Yeah, so you're go for it, man. You're yeah. marketing legend, man. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm Walter Nealens, uh, video producer and presentation trainer. And it's so cool to be on your channel, Stuart, because I'm really impressed with how many videos you've been putting up personally. Mm. And I think it's so cool, uh, you know, because you're all about, you know, doing paid for advertising, you know, running ads and mm. things like that. The fact that you personally are making your own videos for yourself and you've challenged yourself to do them every single day i think it's really really cool and i think it it shows also the power of um organic kind of content as well you know because you got the paid for and then you've got the organic stuff yeah and well thanks man really appreciate that because like one of the challenges that i set for myself like at the end of february was to do a new video every single day to grow the channel because in my mind, like you can get, you know, this one video that becomes an absolute hit, but unless you're trying things constantly and on such a regular basis, YouTube is, is, is prone to forgetting about the smaller channels. And in the grand scheme of things, like mine is a very small drop in the ocean. Because if you look at um, like my friend Stuart Gould or Ben Heath or Jordan Platt, and these are guys with 105, 200,000 subscribers at the time. And if you're competing for the same attention, there's something that you've got to be doing differently. And these guys are obviously at a point where they can't produce a new video every day, but you know, being a smaller channel, I can, I can do that. And it's also quite fun as well, having that creative freedom to try different things out. 
and not be bound by certain rules and and restrictions you know like i vary my introductions i don't just do the same old thing every single time and you begin to see sort of patterns and trends and one thing that was quite surprising talking about holding the attention earlier on which is something that I'd like to talk to you about a little bit later on with your TV presenting days is the things that people like will say to me, like, you know, like friends and family and stuff. And they say, I didn't like that introduction. Um, very often that introduction has got the best success rate for holding people's attention for longer than 30 seconds. Like I've got one video, how to set up a job posting where I've literally got some guy that I've hired to voice over the introduction and say, in this video, you can learn how to set up a job posting. And it's basically got like, you know, the sort of screen in action showing a basic job posting setup. But then it just says, smash the like button, consider subscribing, and let's get into it. And that's where my voice comes on. 87% of people watch past 30 seconds, which yes. is quite something. And, you know, if if I look at like the work that you've done and I did a bit of, you know, digging into like your background, man, like how, how did you even get into like sort of like TV presenting and, and that sort of stuff? Cause that's, you know, that's almost like a whole nother life altogether, just like being on TV and presenting for shows and that sort of stuff. It's, um, it was yeah. quite interesting to learn a bit more about what you did, man. So, Hey, thanks for asking it. Yeah, that is, that is a common question that I've had over the years and, and and totally an absolute blessing as well because i know that it's the kind of work that there are a lot of people out there that would really like to have that and i actually got to get into tv presenting before social media was a big thing as well so i like to think of social media these days as almost almost like the new tv in a way like everyone has got a cell phone now anyone can bust out their phone and you know it has their own media channel you've got your own instagram your own facebook <laughs> and all that and TV is now competing against social media. So TV is com competing for the attention of the masses of all the people Like right now, people could be tuning into this right now that if social media didn't exist, they might be watching TV. So Stuart McAdam and Walt Nealands are taking a little bit of <laughs> TV attention right now. <laughs> but I, I got into it. I was, extra kind of blessed to get into it when i did get into it because there was no facebook or anything youtube was well i think there was facebook but it wasn't like big like it is now you know what i mean what was the year you, the year you got into it uh it was uh was it 2010 i think 2010 maybe 2009 i think it was 2010 when i started so there was definitely social media but i believe i got a facebook account like two years before i was on tv like it was pretty new like i'd only just sort of discovered facebook mm. and stuff and i think people didn't really do the couldn't really do like such a big you know discovery into someone's background just by looking at their social media profiles oh, yeah, nah. like they can now i mean it would have been a very sort of like obscure thing to sort of like this walter neelands and you know you could probably have your personal life quite comfortably whereas in nowadays if you're someone that's big on social media very often you've got to change your name up to something you know, that's not even related to you. Like, you know, um, Walter Johnson or Walter J or something like that. If, if you're wanting to maintain that level of privacy. You're right. You're right. Yeah. And it, it's actually something that I personally need to uh, work on a bit more as my own, my own personal social media stuff. So hence why I'm really proud of you for doing what you're doing with video day. So I want to actually mm. challenge myself with that. So my lovely girlfriend about it the other day, mm. which is super cool. Yeah, man. Um, so anyway, I want to answer your question because people might be watching right now frustrated sure. that I haven't properly answered your question. So you asked me, Stuart, I think, how did I get into TV? And I've totally just been around the bush and not even answered that question. <laughs> so <laughs> let's get into it. Yeah, man. All right. So for everyone, for you who are watching and you're wondering how I actually got into TV, well, it really started out when I was working on a farm and I was actually working on a farm. I was working in a kitchen doing dishes and I think I might have been working at a racing stables as well, like horse racing. So I was, I was juggling these three jobs. Obviously, they were all just part-time. And obviously, they had nothing to do with TV either. And I had this kind of dream inside of me to become a TV host. And when you have a dream like that, it seems 
impossible, it's overwhelming. And uh, you're like, yeah, right. Okay, you want to be a TV host. How on earth is that going to possibly happen? Um, but anyway, I was working on a farm with this guy called Peter Bobel, and I was painting his shed one day, and he said to me, look, well, what do you really want to do? Like, you know, like surely you don't want to be working on this farm all the time, like doing odd jobs for me, drenching cars, painting sheds, doing all that. Um, and I said to him, well, Peter, honestly, if I could do anything, I would love to be a television presenter. I would love to, because I just really like the idea of being a positive role model, like really into that, and influencing people in a good way. And I thought I'm a good person, and I think more good people should be sort of in a spotlight to help others. Um, and he said to me, well, what do you think you need to do to do it? And I said to him, well, I probably need to go to university and study communications. So he said, well, do it. So I signed up for communications. And then what happened was uh, before university even started, a friend of mine said that they had found an a advertised job on TV, like in the Herald, like in Situations Vacant. There was mm. a job opportunity. And uh, it required me to make a little video about myself. And so I made this video doing like some funny jokes and stuff. And uh, they really liked it. So I took the video in. They liked it. They gave me a call back. I was super surprised. I honestly did not think I had any chance in getting it because I thought surely thousands of people would have been doing this. And I think maybe what helped was the fact that I personally drove there and dropped it off rather than posting it. That may have helped because they met me for literally one minute. I was just kind of in there super scared and just gave them the video and said, hey, you know, put on a brave face. And got a call and then got an interview and an audition and. I could talk about that for longer, but basically it was pretty overwhelming, like as in like nerve wracking because it's like a dream job. Like I wanted this more than I'd want to win lotto or anything. I wanted it more than like a million dollars. And so when you're in front of an opportunity that you think is just the coolest thing in the world that you could ever ask for, you, you can feel like you really don't want to stuff it up. Mm. And you made it through like quite a progression with like the stuff that you did. Can you just, tell our listeners some of the um, shows and opportunities that you had as a presenter on TV? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, really blessed, really grateful for the journey that I've ha had with it. Uh, so yeah, I hosted Sticky TV for eight years. So I got to write it and host it. And I was so blessed to work with other really good presenters. So they helped me because whenever you start something new, you know, you could be pretty bad at it, but I had a lot of guidance, and a lot of help and supports that helped me out heaps. Um, until I actually became kind of kind of what you might call you might call me the front man of the show. That's how I was treated, which was really kind. Uh, and then I got to go on Dancing with the Stars. That was epic. It was, it was super fun, super nerve wracking. You know, dancing in front of you, everyone on live TV. And then the hardest part about it is getting grilled by the judges on live TV. <laughs> Like being criticized in front of everyone. <laughs> like, like people can see you reacting to criticism <laughs> when you're saying not nice things about you and everyone's watching. Mm -hmm. So that, that's pretty tough. Uh, I also got to co host a show called Cadbury Dream Factory with Kimberly Crossman, Brooke Howard Smith, Guy Williams. I'm not sorry, not Guy Williams, Guy Montgomery and Jesse Griffin. Uh, awesome people. That was a prime time show. We made people's dreams come true. Like we made it pit snow up in Kaikoui or like a sunny town up north. We made the biggest marshmallow fish in the world, all kinds of crazy stuff. And then uh, during lockdown, I made a TV show from home from right here called Amped, which was mm -hmm. kind of like sticky TV. It was about fun things that you can do from your bubble at home uh, rather than going crazy. We had some fun activities for you. So mm. those are those are the main things that I've done. Obviously, I've done like bits of radio and speech on other shows and all that kind of stuff, like breakfast shows and done live crosses on live TV. But those are the main shows: Sick mm. TV, Amped, Dancing with the Stars, and Cadbury Dream Factory. How did that set you up for what you're doing now with like Screen Get Screen Grab? Because obviously, you started the company. Like, was there initial like vision that you had for the company when you started it and how did your TV days sort of set you up for 
you know, really smashing it in the industry now. Thanks. Yeah, well, it definitely wasn't easy. Um, at the start of this, I, I, was, I was actually really struggling, to be honest with you. I was actually um, feeling quite uh, frustrated in my life. I was feeling really frustrated. I had um, not been doing much TV stuff, and I'd done some work. I was really grateful for this. I, I did some earth-moving work, actually. Uh, a friend who I had hitchhiked with, we became friends. He'd give me some earth-moving work. I'd gone and done a little bit of work in some other fields, and I was feeling quite frustrated. And I, I thought, man, I just want to get into running my own business. And um, I'd worked with another awesome company that I love called Rad Lab. Mm -hmm. They're super great at making videos and photos as well. And I'd done a bit of work there, and I kind of got inspired to do my own thing. And, um, yeah, going into business, it didn't mean that everything just fell on my lap at all. You know, I actually went out door knocking, um, cold calling to get my first clients. Mm. And um, it was it was really tough and and fun at the same time, you know. Yeah. But, but, I, just, but I think you would have won a lot of people over with your charisma, though, because, like, I think a lot of these, like, door knockers can get quite demoralized because they get 99 rejections. But I can almost imagine you door knocking and going, hey, I'm Walter Nealands here. I do videos and I'd love to help your business make an awesome, you know, champion video that can help you drive more leads and sales into your company. Would you be interested? As opposed to like a lot of these people that can have like a very flat, you know, monotone way of speaking and by five seconds, you're already, they're already losing confidence and are slowly creaking the door shut. But I can see that difference though. Like I can see how, you would have stood out there because you've got that experience presenting and I appreciate I, that. And, and I think so many people these days, when it comes to standing in front of the camera and presenting, like they get really nervous. And I think a lot of the time it's so unnecessary because, you know, you want to make people really enjoy what they watch and really feel like, um, they've gotten a lot of value out of it. And if you, sounding nervous and uncertain about what you're saying then you're less likely to hold people's attention and you're also less likely as well to get whatever it is you're wanting to achieve over the line whether it's like watch time like here on youtube or whether you're trying to get a sale or you know say hey the best way to present is you know stand up straight with your yeah. shoulders back or something like that and i could really see that in you man like even when i chatted to you for the first time um, on the phone, I could just hear that energy and enthusiasm through the phone. And I think that's that's what I really remember any time I hear the name Bolton Nealands, it's just that energy and enthusiasm that carries through into everything. And it's the same thing with your videos as well. So Thanks. I really um, appreciate your compliment. Um, I, and hey, by the way, that's not to say that I, I didn't have many tough days doing what I was doing with Donald, mm -hmm. too, by the way. What were um, the tough days? Can you, can you tell challenge. me a few stories? What's that, sorry? Can you tell me a few stories about these tough days? Oh, um, I just, oh, I'm trying to think of one right now, actually. I just remember the feeling of, uh, you know, hearing lots of times people, actually, you know what? It wasn't too often that people wouldn't be interested. Um, it's just you wouldn't get, like, a obviously a sale on the spot. So there's a lot of, you know, just typical sales. So the first time that you kind of chat with someone, it's it's more just an introduction. That's something that I kind of learned. I think when I first got into doing sales, I was frustrated. Like, oh, why am I just getting a sale? Well, it's because a lot of the time it's about building a relationship with people and maybe they don't need your product or service right here, right now. And so it's nothing personal. And so now with sales, I'm, I'm less kind of pushy about things. And I just understand that, you know, it's about the relationship is the most important thing relationship over the transaction and you'll be able to build off that in the future if and when they need your help uh so but yeah i do remember you're feeling many times very uh sort of uh, a little bit frustrated about things and um and that's that's just kind of part of the process and that's what grows you and that's why i have so much respect for anyone in business Anyone that does sales, like I just admire that tenacious personality. Mm. I'm just a person that, you know, 
goes through that because it takes a lot of energy honestly physical labor is easier than doing that kind of work like i could go outside and smack build things all day long like that's that's easy getting a sweat on is great but uh but the mental kind of energy of doing business is uh, quite consuming yeah because i think you also have to be like considering as well the the obstacles and the possible objections that they could come come up with yeah. and also trying to figure out a way to understand that like asking if if they say i need to think about it and you know putting forward the thing of is there anything that has been explained so far that you're not sure about or do you need clarity around a particular area of the proposal or the pitch or something like that it, it runs over and over again yeah totally no you're, you're totally right yeah i think have another oh, sorry yeah yeah you go ahead man I was just trying to think if I'd fully answered your question, just in case, you know, you're watching and thinking that you wanted me to answer your question fully. So no, you asked me good, about, um, you're good. I'm frustrated. Oh, and you talked a little bit about the enthusiastic attitude. Yeah, totally. Mm, is that something that you've always had? Have you always been that kind of like, you know, bubbly, vibrant personality? Is that something that was like encouraged as a youngster in, into you? Or is it something that you've, you developed over time? Hmm. Hey, great question. I would say that it was developed, I think. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of developed. And I think Sticky TV really pushed that as well. I think that being on a, being, especially on a kid's show, uh, having to learn to be on, and because I'd get uh, uh, feedback from, say, the, the office, so the producer of the show would watch me on screen when the videos got back to the office for edit, and then, you know, I'd go back to the office and they'd say, hey, come in, we need to chat about your performance. So I got lots of those. And a thing that would come up a lot is to have your eyes on. So be on. Like people should be able to feel like good energy coming off you when they watch you on screen. Mm. And so especially because my job was on the line, I really took that on board. And so it became an automatic thing when the camera's on, like I come alive kind of thing. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I can be pretty, pretty chill sometimes as well, just like anyone, like I'm a human being, just like anybody else, but I do really enjoy it when the camera's on. And I think I actually get a rush of excitement when the camera's on mm -hmm. because I'm so used to like turning it on when the camera's on. So now mm. I think it kind of almost automatically comes on. That's cool, I'm man. Like, I've been trained like a dog, like, oh, when the camera's on, you're on. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's so interesting how that, like, I guess, parallels into like the screen grab stuff because you do in-person presenting, but you also do like video editing as well. And you do voiceovers and sometimes appear in the videos too. Is how long did it take you to really develop a good sort of art and craft for making like a sharp, slick video? Mm. Um, honestly, man, I freaked out at, at the start about it because I'd been presenting on TV, right? But I hadn't been like filming the videos or I'd been writing the scripts and presenting and the personal videos that I'd made, I wasn't too impressed with. And so it took me a little while and then I started to realize that, yeah, I could do this. Um, I don't know, maybe a couple of months, you know, I got the I got a team involved to help me. Right. So having other people that are like good at their bits of the project really helped, you know, like videographers and things mm -hmm. really helped a lot. So yeah, probably, probably took us a couple of months. Yeah. To mm -hmm. do some videos that I was proud of and, yeah, and it's just like anything that you try, you get more confident as you go along. Mm. Yeah. Like I'd actually tried to pitch a TV show pilot and I filmed it and I thought it was just so bad. I thought it was so bad. Um, and I think you just got to learn to, yeah, push past the failures. And this is a good lesson for me even right now. There's areas in my life that I'm working on at the moment uh, that I have to remind myself to push past those things. Mm. Um to keep keep learning and have that kind of humility to have a crack at things. Mm. Where's someone I'm really impressed with right now? Who? Uh, Julian, what's his name? The the actor kid from New Zealand that was in Deadpool and you know, 
hunt for the wilder people and oh. the Lynx ads. Yeah, I know, and I know you. I know you. Julian Dennison or something. Julius and the name escapes me too, man. But I know just, who you're talking about. Just he's absolutely right crushing now it. We're live. No. <laughs> I think it's Julian Anderson. Anyway, he's in the Deadpool movies and stuff. He's been. Um, I saw a cool video that he put out. Oh, Butterbean put out the other day of him working out to like drop lose lose weight at the moment. And uh, it's just really inspiring because he's really cracked it in the movies and stuff. And he was talking about in this little video about how he is really having to humble himself and, you know, feel what it feels like to work hard again kind of thing. Mm. And I think that's like with with the stuff that you did with like the door-to-door sales and building up the videos to the point where you were confident with that, like how long did it take for you to build screen grab up to the point where it is now? Was that yeah. like quite a, a journey over a period of time before you really thought I've got a good balance between what I um, have worked on and what I can put out to people? Yeah, probably like a year, I would say. Um, and the business is still growing. Uh, like definitely like it's still you know, it's still like what I would call like a, a an infant business. Like it's, you know, it's got a long way to go kind of thing. So just to be transparent with everyone, you know, I don't want to try and mm. put on some kind of a big show like, oh, this <laughs> business is massive. I mean, yeah, like wants to go big and it's growing. Uh, so, yeah, but probably probably about a year, you know, until we could actually put together like a bit of a show reel of like, like, oh, wow, cool. We've done some cool stuff now kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. So if I was to ask Walter Nealands, what are five things that go into a good video, Mm. what would they be? I would say number one, just I'm going to say these as they just come to my mind. I would say a message that's relevant to your audience. All right. So like that, like that's the most important thing. Like, for example, you will have seen plenty of movies in your lifetime and say movies like Transformers. I think they have some of the biggest budgets ever. Uh, But I'm sure that Transformers isn't necessarily your favorite movie. Your favorite movie is probably one with a storyline that you can relate to or that you really connect with for some reason. Maybe there's a character in it that you really like. So it's not going to be about how big the budget was on the thing. It's about the story. It's about saying something that your audience connects with. Hmm. And I've been doing it during this interview, actually. Every now and then you might have noticed that I've been saying you, you referring to you who are watching this. So I'm referring to you, Stuart, and I'm referring mm-hmm. to the audience as well because I'm trying to make this inclusive of you, uh, of, of everyone, the mm-hmm. way that I'm speaking. Okay. I want you to be a part of this. Yeah. That's why I'm being considerate. And I say, I hope I answered that question properly because I'm trying to go back and I'm thinking of everyone who's watching this right now as I present to... To make sure that you feel like I'm giving, I'm 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 serving you. Mm-hmm. So that's mess- So that's number one. What would the other four things be that you would say are you know crucial to a good video? I think, like you pointed out earlier, it's got to grab attention. Like the start's really important, obviously. And I think with social media, it's about showing that pretty early on. Um, I I also think that having the the tagline on a video is really quite important too. Like the caption alone could probably do quite a lot for a video. Like, hey, um, say we're doing a video on like how to make a great video. Like if that's in the caption down the bottom, then that's probably going to keep people watching a little bit longer because they're going to be like waiting for it. Okay, when's the good bit? But yeah, getting people's uh, attention at the start is definitely important. Okay, so that'll be number two. Number three, I would say, well, if it's a sales video, having a clear call to action at the end of it and delivering it well, okay? So if you're doing a piece to camera video like this right now, like if I'm presenting a video and I want you to give me a call at the end of the video to get in touch with me about my building services, I'd, I'd make it really clear at the end. So, hey, look, if you want to have a quote for your business uh, on a renovation or a new build, then give us a call. The number's right there and we look forward to chatting with you. Hmm. So see how I delivered that nice and strong and I looked down the lens as I did that? Sometimes what you'll get when someone's at the end of a video is they'll their confidence will drop and they won't be 
bringing it up and creating those good feelings for the audience at the end. So smiling at the end of a video is really important, the way that you present it, because you really want to leave a good taste in your audience's mouth or in their mind so that they'll want to come back, so that they'll remember you, they'll want to see you. So it's about creating a good feeling for the audience. And that applies obviously to the start, middle and the end, but just definitely at the end as well. Like make sure that it feels good. Remember, it's actually about communicating an emotion and a message. So make sure that people grab a hold of that. Hope I explained that properly. Yep, sure did, man. Clear call to action. Make it feel good. There you go. Awesome. Good. Work. Number four, I'm going to say have a script. I think having a script is so good. I mean, that just helps with confidence in general. Uh, 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 confidence behind the whole project, obviously, the video project. Uh, if it is a video where you're presenting in it, it gives you confidence because you know what you're talking about. Uh, like prep is just a big part of success in most things, really. And so having a script is it's having a blueprint for your video. You know, you've thought it out, you've seen a bit of it in your mind, you've got a plan. When you go to film the thing, it's more efficient because you know what shots you want to get, you know what you want to say. Um, it's great for the editor as well because they can look at the script and go, oh, yeah, cool, so we need to, I need to find this shot here and put this in here. Okay, cool, this goes here. So, yeah, a script is just having a plan, and I think that's really important. And when you write your script, it's important that you know what the goal is for the video. So why are you making a video in the first place? Is it to get sales? Is it for brand awareness? Is it to just explain something? You now, why are you making, is it for brand awareness? Like this video right now? Is it like, what? what's the video for? Because when you know what the video is for, then you know, why you're writing the script so you need to make sure that whatever your goal is the video is aiming towards achieving that yeah that would be number four have a script and, and a basic formula for a script would be catchy intro that like hooks people so some kind of a hook that gets the right kind of people interested say for example you're doing a video uh, to get people to come along to your gym all right, so you might start off with a cool shot of someone doing some bicep curls or just something catchy, you mm -hmm. know, like, hey, are you thinking of joining the gym? Or, you know, just something catchy at the start that hooks people that are interested in the gym. And then you've obviously got your middle and then you've got your end and it should all make sense. So you've got your call to action at the end. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, there's your script. And number five off the cuff for a good video. All right. I would say sound is really important and then making it look good are important. Now, obviously there's heaps of viral videos out there that don't look good, right? Because the story is the most important thing. It is by far more important than having a fancy flash camera and all that kind of stuff. Okay. The, the message of the video is the most important thing, but Hey, if you're going to invest in having a professional video, <laughs> I'd say it's definitely worth making it look good. Mm. It's the same reason why when you go into a meeting, you want to dress up for your, for your client. You know, you want to look good. You want to make a good impression. You know, mm. your videos are representing your business. How do you want your business to be perceived? So professional is good. Sound is a huge, important part of video. If you've got uh, bad visuals, people aren't going to notice it as much. But if you've got bad sound, people are going to notice that. Mm. Okay, so about... Five years ago, there was the VMAs, so the Vodafone Music Awards, and it was live broadcast on TV. And that night, the sound dropped out while everyone was watching it from home on their TVs. Oh. And it was so bad. It, like, we kind of muffly and bad. Like, you could still hear something, but it was, like, really quiet. Oh, man, it was terrible. People were talking about it the next day, like, oh, my goodness, did you see the VMAs? The sound dropped out. They weren't complaining about Maybe they had one or two bad camera shots or whatever. Sound is so important. So just having good sound, that's it. Doesn't need to be the best sound, but just like good, clear sound. So uh, for that, having a good microphone. I'll just grab one right now that I use. Yeah, man. Uh, so I use a little Rode Go. Uh, hey, I'm just trying to find the other part of it. Uh, and it's just a great little mic that you can clip on. Uh, yeah, so it's 
So here is the Rogue Go mic. Okay. So this one's quite cool. By the way, I'm not sponsored by these guys or anything. So it's like two parts. So this bit here, just hold that up to you. A little Rogue Go thing. Uh, this just plugs into your actual camera, right? And then the other one, you got another box here. And this has got a wire on it, a little microphone on it. And you pop this in your pocket. So uh, in there, and then you pop this one. It clips onto your top. And so you run it up under here and then, you know, clip it on here. And that's going to get real good sound. And the thing I really love about this one is that it's wireless. So awesome. this is the receiver. And you don't have to have a wire attached to this running to this one that I'm wearing down here. That just sits on your camera and it picks it up and it gives you good clear sound. Awesome, yeah. man. No, that's so cool. Like I think <clears throat> all of Which those things like yeah. definitely have a place in the um in creating the video and the content. Like I remember looking at the first videos that I did on the YouTube channel and it was in like a dark room and the lighting was bad and the visual was terrible and the sound was not clear. But as time has gone on and just even the way that you're sort of talking and presenting and stuff and doing your research like for the videos, it's really progressed. And I think as soon as I shifted from putting out volume after volume of like video lives and that sort of thing to you know, spending a bit more time researching what people are, are looking up and what the end objective is and looking at high volume keywords, uh, the channel really started to grow quite exponentially. Um, it's still tiny by a lot of people's standards, but it's grown faster than I could have imagined. And I think a lot of it is actually from looking at what people like yourself are doing and other big players like Rad Lab and those guys and seeing, okay, how did these guys put together a commercial for the All Blacks? How do, how does Walter Nealands put together um, a presentation for a client of his that he does, does marketing work for or a one-off video like composition? Does he have multiple options and angles that he comes from? And I think that definitely helps too with, with videos. If you come up with, four or five concepts and you just put them all together you, you film oh. them all you shoot them all and then at the end you might find that a hybrid model might work the best or your second or third idea that you had is actually the runaway winner at the end of the day oh. and even if you don't think it is because that's such a hard thing to predict is what is going to hold people's attention best you may have a thought that this thing can hold people's attention best, but you don't actually know that until you put it out there into the marketplace and you test it. That's a really good point. That is a really good point because we have our own perception of what's good and then other people see things differently. Mm. But not everyone sees, I've actually been surprised. We have done videos in the past and I've received an edit, say like someone on the team's edited the video and I've thought, Ooh, um, I'm not sure. I think this is okay. But then I've thought, I've, I just heard someone say that quote that not every time people are going to think the same way as you. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to put it in the client's hands. I'm just going to send them this draft of the video. And then the client has loved it. And I thought, oh, sweet, cool. Mm. All right. That confirms it. Obviously, you... we're hired for a reason because we do know what we're doing. But Sometimes things are a little bit, you know, you want to leave it in the clients, um, how they see something sometimes. So. Mm. And sometimes you don't, you don't want to end up like, um, like the Star Wars movies where George Lucas is like, you know, forever going back and editing them. You know, you want to have a, a certain point where you're just like, yep, sweet. We've got to put something forward on the table because especially yeah, if yeah. you're working to deadlines with clients and you've got limited time and, limited budget and resources and availability yep. of like contractors and stuff, you have to be able to be confident enough to put something together that may not be hundred percent of what you um, would be fully satisfied with, but enough to meet all of the other demands that, you know, come with it. Yeah. Def oh, def absolutely. Of course. Yeah. There's always restrictions on things for sure. Mm. And I actually just want to point one more thing out and sure. that is, when it comes to planning or scripting a video, 
One thing I've learned, and this is from doing literally thousands of episodes of television, uh, is that, you know, it's important to have a plan, but barely ever does things go exactly to plan. So it's about being open to a little bit of flexibility. You know, sometimes when you go to shoot something, a shot does a shot. You, you think of another shot that you could add in or whatever, you know what I mean? And then you end up using that. So there's a little bit of flexibility behind every plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Tell me, can you tell me a bit more about what you do with helping people with like presenting in public, um, you know, in, in public and also, I guess, as well, if they're in front of a client or yeah. pitching to someone that's interested in buying the, like the product or service that they're selling? Yeah, absolutely. So because I come from the television presenting background, you know, that, that involves doing video and it involves obviously presenting. And so what happened was originally screen grab, we were just doing video and then we started working with clients and they were, you know, they wanted to be on front of the camera. So a lot of real estate professionals and these real estate professionals would be struggling to present their videos. You know, they want to do like profile videos about themselves. And they would be doing take after take and they'd look nervous and they'd be looking off camera and acting differently, not speaking clearly, like just looking like a mess. And I thought, man, I really, I feel like I can help these people. And so I'd be there directing them and, you know, helping them get better. And so that's where that came from was uh, recognizing that, okay, presenting is actually a, it's a skill and it's something that can be learned. And I can teach it. And because when I think about myself, when I first got into presenting, oh, man, I remember now, like, oh, that's right. It was shocking. Like, I was so nervous and uptight. And just some people put on a funny accent when the camera comes on. Like, you know, I remember that. <laughs> and, and then I had a team of people that were other great presenters that helped me. And obviously the reps helped a lot as well. And so, yeah, so to, to answer your question, how do I help people with that? So I put together a five week program and we cover things like public speaking, building rapport, building trust with people that's like in person and, and presenting on camera as well. Because if you want to brand yourself like personal brand these days, you need some media about yourself. That's a, that's a big part of your personal brand, right? Like, being able to speak on video, speak on camera, like you and I are doing right now. Mm -hmm. And, and it's a great way because when you have a video of yourself and you put it out there, rather than you just speaking one-on-one -on -one to someone in real life, you know, there's tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of people that can see it and connect with you. Mm. And so this video right now is just you and I having a conversation, but People are going to see it over time from this one moment we've captured and they're going to see our personalities. Mm. You know, you're watching this video and you can see what Stuart's like. You can see what I'm like. You've got an impression of who we are and you're thinking, well, is this someone that I resonate with? Is this someone that I might want to do business with? So that's the power of video is you can actually show your personality and you can connect with people like that. Mm. What's the biggest mistake that people make when they are presenting videos or just speaking publicly? Well, well, first of all, I actually just want to congratulate everyone that has done it. Um, because when you do see someone struggling to present on camera, I think a lot of us empathize with them and we think, you know, good on them for giving a crack, giving it a crack, you know? So I think we do actually empathize with it. And so we'll, we'll watch cause we think good on them. Um, but I think one of the biggest mistakes people make are not, oh yeah, okay. They forget to come from a place of service when they present. So when you present, I think we talked about this earlier, mm. maybe even before this video call, we had a quick catch up. Um, they forget that you're connecting with other humans. And so when you're presenting, you're actually serving. Okay. When you're on camera, you want to be coming from that position of wanting of, of helping others. Cause you know how you feel good when you help someone like, you know, you give someone a Christmas gift that you're and, and it's something special and you know, they're going to love it. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, that feeling you get and you're like, I can't wait till they open this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Love it. <laughs> oh. 
you know, you're giving something to someone, right? And so in this video right now, what Stuart and I are trying to give to our awesome audience is we're trying to give you some uh, knowledge that you can apply in your life. And so when you come from that position of wanting to give value to others, then it actually reflects in the way that you hold yourself. You know, you can put more energy into something when you know it's going to do good for someone else. But if you come from that place of just wanting to take from others and you're just, you just, you're worried about what you look like and, you know, do I look good? You know, it is important to look good. But the most important thing is that you're trying to serve who you're watching. And when you do that, you'll communicate better. The mm -hmm. vibe you'll give off is better. You might even smile more. You might put more oomph behind what you're saying. But when you're so self-conscious, you're going to restrict yourself a bit and you're going to not present as as effectively. You know, one guy I think that presents really well. I don't think I don't know if he's ever done it like publicly in front of an audience before. Is is Dave Beechin? We both yeah. know Dave. Yeah, great guy, but the just name. a terrific person in terms of how he communicates and how he's never um, over talks. He doesn't talk too fast or too technically that you can't understand what he's saying. But he just has a really good way of building rapport with people. And I think part of the reason why that's come about is because he's done sales before, like working at the TV shop and also just, you know, many times over with, with his company, Flow Marketing. And talks in a very balanced way. He talks about helping people and gives people the space to make a decision as well. And I think that's something that, is really undervalued as well as just allowing people to make that decision themselves rather than just forcing it on them. And mm. I think many marketers, if you just give people a chance to make the decision and kind of invite them in rather than push them in, um, they're much more likely to actually engage with you in quite a meaningful way. And I found that with um, so many things that, um, have happened with you know pitching to potential clients is saying hey even if you don't go ahead and work with me you're always welcome to come over to the youtube channel i've got and you can get free tutorials you can upskill yourself and you can actually know what whoever um, you're working with that's running your ads is talking about because you know how it gets set up you know how long it takes and you know how to measure the results i think that is such an awesome thing that you just said. Mm. I think that is so true. You know, and I think that's something that I, I actually have had to work on as well and do, still do. And because you just said that, it's top of mind for me now as well. Like, so thank you for actually sharing that. I think that's a really good point. Mm, so absolutely. Dave Beecham, who, who we're talking about, Ryden's Flow Marketing, and you're right, he is an amazing communicator. Like, like you said, he's really balanced and he doesn't uh, put pressure on you to buy or anything like that he literally comes from that place kind of like what i said about uh, of wanting to serve others and when you come from a place of uh, and you can show it that you actually are honest and trustworthy to someone then they are more likely to want to then they feel connected with you because they feel like mm. you have their best interests at heart yeah so if you can communicate honesty to people then they then they trust you because you're honest mm. If you can ever, like like what you said, Stuart, about how you say to clients, hey, look, whether you come on board with me or not, um, it's fine. Uh, you can still check out the YouTube channel. There's value there for you. So you've just said basically that, um, you know, something that's not necessarily in your best interest. I mean, it is good for you because it's good for your branding and everything. But you're saying to the client, hey, look, you don't have to spend this money with me. You can actually go get some here's something for free that you can have and so in a way it's almost like you're saying you, you know you're, you're free to go here's some value anyway hmm. and so people go oh wow he's not trying to just suck me in and take business from me he's saying hey go and here's some value mm -hmm. it's really cool it's showing showing that it's like for a real estate agent if they're showing a buyer through a home and they know that home's got a leak or something that needs fixing on it. And they, they, they disclose that to the buyer. They say, Hey, look, it is an amazing house, but I just want to point out the fact that it actually has a leak. 
then that buyer goes, oh, wow, this person has just said something to me that is not in their best interest because it might turn me away from buying this property and then they won't make any money. Mm -hmm. um, but it's in my best interest. Obviously, legally, they have to disclose it anyway. I'm just trying to use an example here. Yeah, well, it's a good one to use, man, because I think that's definitely an industry along with probably used cars and also I think a lot of people in the legal industry as well, like law firms, where there can be a propensity to, to hide things, um, whether it's related to cost, whether it's related to potential problems and areas of conflict um, yeah. that don't, you know, initially might get you the sale, but over the long term might create problems later on. And I think if you're up front a lot more about how you want to operate, that definitely helps too, because obviously I'd imagine with the work that you do, yeah, there are particular industries that would need your help a lot more than others, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah, totally. And so that transparency and that honesty in, in any business really helps. And that, that's just a great form of communication. If you can communicate honesty early on, then people are going to trust you. And that's really what we want. We want trust with people, right? Communication is anything that you want in life, pretty much anything, is behind a conversation with someone. It's behind some kind of form of communication. You know, you want an opportunity to work with another business, you got to talk to them first. You want a job somewhere, you got to talk to them first. You want someone to be your girlfriend or boyfriend, you got to talk to them first. You got to communicate. You got to establish that kind of that mm. trust and rapport with people. Mm. And uh, yeah, I really like what you're saying. And it's really cool. Awesome. About not being pushy with people. Because as soon as you're pushy with, no one likes being pushed into something. No, ah, not at all. And it's, 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 it doesn't work like that anymore when it comes to marketing. It's not, mm. um, it's not push marketing anymore. It's like, it's traditional inbound marketing, if you were like, you know, we sort of educating and empowering people to make a decision for themselves. That's really what's going to persuade them these days. And mm. if you can like very often, if you put together a portfolio of your best videos, you're far more likely to win their trust and confidence than somebody who's just selling them a dream but can't really back it up with anything. Because I think a lot of people like to to see results and see what's been done before. And even mm -hmm. if you've got nothing, just like making something for your own business as well, like something that people can just have a look at, I think yeah. is such a underrated tool as well in so many ways, because I think like, you know, I haven't got a client yet. Well, you have got a client. It's just, it's your own business. Make a video, um, create an ad, create some ad copy around it. Uh, look at how you can put together a nice static image, pay a graphic designer, uh, you know, for an hour's work to put together something super flash that you can put forward in front of people and at least have an example. Because so often that gets overlooked too, doesn't it? Is It's just the work that you've done before. You think, oh yeah, it's yesterday stuff. But no, like that stuff is powerful, particularly if you've, if it's transformed that person's business or really helped people in a way. Um, having that portfolio or having those case studies and testimonials that you can really lean on to help That's you very good get future business. That's a very good point. And if, just to emphasize your point, Stuart, yeah, definitely recommend any every business watching this. Like if you, even if you've got a phone, like like you said, I think Stuart, you said you recommended a client do it just the other day. Uh, get some video footage. Get something that you can put out there and that you can show. Like. Every job you do is actually an opportunity for you to, to market like what you've done. You're right. So get a little clip of it, get a little photo of it. That's so true. Mm. What are you like? If you're pitching to someone like for, for a video, what do you normally put into like a proposal? Um, well, normally what happens is I like to have a conversation with the business owner about, about the business and find out a bit about it. So we have that initial conversation. And then I probably overdo it a lot of the time. Uh, other companies might want to receive a bit of money, but uh, oftentimes I'll start writing the script, which is normally something that people would pay for. But you'd normally get a deposit or something before you start doing that. But oftentimes with clients, yeah, I'll, I'll jimmy something up, like a draft script or something like that. 
um, because it actually gives me confidence in the video we're going to create as well. Uh, and, and then they can see it as well and we can talk over it. So oftentimes, yeah, I'll interview you about your business. I'll find out, you know, like, what is it that you're selling? You know, what's great about it? Why would people want to buy it? I'll find out who your buyer is. And then I'll add my imagination to it. And, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, like where, what location are we going to shoot? What kind of shots are we going to get? And I start developing the script from there. And I like to get the client to sign off the, sign off the script before we, you know, go ahead and film something. So you know what you're in for. You know, different clients are going to be different. We did a video the other day and the client just wanted us to just do it on the spot. So, of course, we're going to be flexible with you. Like, if you want us to just do it like that, we're going to do it like that. But I think having a plan first is always the best way to go. So, yeah, that's what we do. We yeah. meet up, find about, out about your business, put something on paper, we, go, we create a brief, and then we move forward from there. Mm. How many iterations would you normally go through on, like, a standard video before you sort of have the final product? For the script, uh, that happens pretty quick. What about I'm, I'm talking? Sorry about the like the actual filming oh, content actual and stuff itself. Okay, um, depends on the client. So we try and get everything right the first time, but I don't think that happens every time. So oftentimes, you know, uh, the client will see the video and then they'll want something tweaked. You know, they'll just something, and that's important because it's the way that you want the video at the end of the day. You know, we do our bit make it as great as we can by the end of the day it's about serving you and if there's something that you want in it well it's your business you know your business better than we know it and we're going to make some adjustments for you if you want something adjusted we'll, we'll do that obviously if we think the adjustment that you're doing is detrimental then we'll, we'll let you know but you're paying for it at the end of the day and we're here to serve you so mm -hmm. we want you to be happy that's our goal awesome how many people like are in the screen grab team? Uh, I would say about four. Yeah, about four of us. Yeah. So, video videographers, editors, photographers, myself, obviously, writer, presenter, director, videographer as well, editor. Yeah, about about four four people. Cool, man. Some, um, and we'll definitely include some links to uh videos that you've done before so people can have a look at what you've done and also a link to screen grab on yeah the totally check us out and if you are considering having a video definitely give us a call we'd love to chat or send us an email however you you want to communicate with us and uh even if it's just to, to chat a bit about your business and maybe you want a video in the future that's cool we're always keen to connect find out a bit about you and who knows where we could take things. Mm. Where can people find you, Walter? So you can find our website, which is www.screengrab, S-C-R-E-E-N-G-R-A-B. So it's like TV screen grabbing attention, screengrab.co.nz. Or you can find us on our Facebook page, which is just screengrab. And then we have uh, Instagram, ScreenGrabNZ, I put on there because there's another Instagram account. So it's ScreenGrab and then NZ on the end, ScreenGrab New Zealand. Mm. Yeah, check us out. Well, give, give me a call. Hey, that's even better. Awesome. Thanks, we'll put Walter's contact what? information oh, yeah. to the description totally. box below. Definitely. Yeah, give us a call. Like, that, that's the best. Awesome. Walter, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. I always enjoy talking with you, man, and I definitely would like to get you on the channel again at some point to discuss a couple more things because as we were talking, there were like seven or eight other side things we could have started discussing, but um, we'll just leave it there because we're almost running up on the hour that we've got available for this chat, man. So, hey, thanks so much, buddy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, for watching, especially if you watched at this point. Remember to reach out and, yeah, keep up the amazing work, Stuart. Thank you.